later. Valerie, your voice is very muted. Oh no, not again. Is this better? Yeah, it's great. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, if you have trouble hearing me at any time, just tell me and I will start speaking louder. Um, and I apologize in advance if you see a cat going across my desk. That is just par for the course around here. Okay. Um, so what were, did, who can tell me if you saw the film? Um, we can pretend I'm, we're, in, we're in school and you can just tell me if you read the book. Um, so if you saw the film, just let me know by raising your hands. And if not, oh, thank you, Sandra. Okay, so some people did. That's good. Um, I thought it was a very compelling film. It came out a few years ago and it really tells a lot of stories at once. Um, and what I wanna do is shed a little bit more light on the historical context. I don't know too much about archeological technology. So I'm not gonna be able to explain how his machinery works, where he scans the ground and sees exactly. That is not something I'm comfortable. Um, can you not hear? Oh, I'm sorry, Ellen, you're muted, so I can't. I'm sorry, I don't need to interrupt you, but um, 60 Minutes had this show on um, him doing the tunnel work and he worked out a deal with Exxon um, who had the machinery to um, detect tunnels and such underground. So he borrowed, they lent him this equipment, it oh. wasn't said so in the film, um, but they lent him this equipment for, I don't know, a month or two months. So he had to work very quickly to, to locate the tunnels, but I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> That's okay, that's good to know. That's probably also something we could, we could watch. Um, probably anyway. the Phillies have the best uh, tunnel detection technology in the world because that's what they're using on the Gaza side all the time uh, to detect the uh, tunnels and... Uh, well, that's, that, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is employing um, a very different uh, sort of a different style of archaeology, if you if you will, or a different um, different technique in that it his his big um, his big thing is he doesn't want to interrupt structures which are not supposed to be interrupted underground. In other words, he doesn't he doesn't want to disturb sacred ground um, by using um, Tech, archaeological techniques that are that are disruptive to to you know objects or or human remains or whatever it might have you that he feels would be um, inappropriate or in bad taste. So he he tries to use this non-invasive uh, technique to pinpoint where he wants to be and to get as much information, which as little as little intrusion as possible about what's underneath the ground. Okay, so um, this, the reason I thought this was such a fascinating subject is because um, many people don't know much about it. We People have heard of Ponar, which was the um, execution site outside of Vilna People have heard of the partisans who fought in the forests. Um, but when you have so many people killed in such a horrific fashion, the escape of 11 people outside through a tunnel that they dug themselves in the course of a couple of months is pretty remarkable. And for many, many years, we didn't have evidence that this tunnel actually existed. We didn't have evidence that could confirm the existence of it underneath the ground. And so when 2017 came and this technology revealed that the stories told by survivors to their children in Israel, in the film, were actually true, um, that was a huge breakthrough. It made international news and it really gave these survivors' children some closure 
that the stories they had been hearing throughout the years actually were true, were not romanticized or were not made up or were not, you know, embellished, that they actually had a, a lot of basis in fact. Um, so it was a very big deal because one of the things that the Nazis did pretty consistently when they left places was they tried to cover up their, their mess, if you will. They tried to remove the evidence of what they had done. And so that's something that Holocaust deniers use as fodder. They'll say, well, if you go to such and such a place, that doesn't exist anymore. So how can you prove that this actually happened? So every piece of the puzzle that we get through technology like this and other and other, you know, means of exploration are really important because they help uh, they help to combat the the continual claims of Holocaust deniers that that historians are exaggerating or that they're not telling the truth or that we can't believe the testimony of survivors and and the list goes on and on. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to just give you a historical overview of what took place in this period. Um, and then we're going to look at a couple of um, a couple of survivor testimonies, very short clips, like two minutes each, of three individuals who lived at this time and whose uh, whose testimonies are on the Yad Vashem archive, in the Yad Vashem uh, digital archive. Um, and we'll get a sense of what it was like to be in Vilna in this period. I have to warn you that it's extremely graphic and difficult to listen to. Um, and I used to teach the Holocaust when I was a professor at Towson. So sometimes I will sound very, um, like, dis um, very, uh, disconnected, uh, very objective when I'm talking about things. And it's not because I, I don't want to show empathy. It's because if I talk about it as a Jew and as a, um, as a human being who is, was, you know, looking at um, history from a personal perspective, I won't be able to keep it together. So if I sound very um, sort of uh, disconnected or not, you know, not like I'm talking about the subject I'm talking about. It's it's just a rhetorical strategy that I have to use because I can't I can't talk about the subject without getting very emotional. So it's um, I, I sort of go into um, you know a language that might seem like I'm talking about something very different, um, but I it's just the nature of the subject matter is so difficult that that's that's what I end up having to do. Um, so I'm just warning you in advance that the imagery can be very, it is very difficult. And I'm sure we all know that just from watching the video and just hearing this little overview of what took place. Um, so Fred, I'm seeing that you just entered the waiting room, but I see you right in front of me. So I'm sort of confused. Okay, there you go. Fred's in multiple places at once. Okay, anyway. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, Lithuania in 1940. Um, so we know that Vilna was considered the Jerusalem, uh, one, of, one of the Jerusalems of Europe, if you will, in terms of its history and the fact that 40% of the population was Jewish in Vilna, which was an enormous percentage of the population. Um, and it was really an important Jewish center. The film talked a lot about the importance of the Great Synagogue as being one of a hundred different synagogues that were present in Vilna um, on the eve of the Holocaust. Um, in 1940, though, um, we we had a very high level of anti-Semitism. Um, the Soviets controlled Lithuania at the time, and the Germans were about to invade and push the Soviets out. Um, and what took place was that the Germans found a great deal of collaboration um, on the part of the Soviet, um, on the part of the Lithuanians. Um, so they employed Lithuanian volunteers 
in their efforts to persecute the Jews. Um, and very rapidly, they invaded the city of Vilna in June of 1941. Um, they found their Lithuanian collaborators and they found pits that had been dug by the Soviets to use for the storage of oil and gas. And they decided to take over these pits and use them as burial sites for the initial victims. Um, and this would really be the initial stage of um, killing the Jews, essentially. There's, there's usually considered three stages. There's the initial, and, and people believe that the summer of 1941 is when the Germans or the Nazis made their sort of grand plan to, to uh, essentially engage in genocide um, and to make this a, a across the board final solution. Um, between 39 and 41, they were putting people in ghettos and were basically isolating Jews from the rest of the population and trying to put them into particular areas that were separate from everyone else. But the reason that this period is so important is because this is when the final solution is begun, is thought to have been sort of um, decided upon. Um, the initial method of killing, sadly, or there's no word that's going to be appropriate for this, but was this, was this, was actually killing people one by one um, with these collaborators with the Einsatzgruppen and, and, and using guns. Um, and that would then transition to this more impersonal, you know, distant form of murder, which was the camps, the concentrate, the, the gas, you know, the, the concentration camps um, and the death camps, which was, if you think about it, if you're, if you're trying to do what they did, um, it became too taxing to have to round up individuals and kill them one by one. The putting people in a hold on. putting people in a gas chamber or putting people in a camp and then rounding them up and putting them in a gas chamber was a I'm going to use this language again a more efficient method and that's what they were looking for and that's exactly what they would have called it as disgusting as that sounds. Um, so the Germans would invade Lithuania and they would push out the Soviets um, and they would begin to round up people and, and take them um, by truck, by foot or by train. They would take them from Vilna, from the Vilna ghetto into the forest and they would kill them um, with guns. Um, they would put them into burial pits that they had used because of the Soviets. Um, and then the biggest problem was how do you cover up this crime when they knew that the Russian army would be approaching in 1943. So at this point, they, um, they faced a bit of a problem. And the, uh, some, some Jews, such as Abba Kovner, had actually escaped the ghetto through sewers and had ended up in the forests. Those people are usually referred to as partisans. And there's a lot of information out on partisans and the activity of the partisans, um, which in Lithuania was called the FPO. Uh, that's the resistance group, that, that local resistance group. Um, they had murdered 70,000 Jews by 1943. By the end of the year, the Nazis knew that the Russians were on the border and they were ready to take back Lithuania. Um, as time went on, they had literally gotten to 100,000 deaths. How do we know that? Because the Nazis required um, their Einsatzgruppen to take meticulous records of how many people they killed and they would write it down. And we have lists of how many men, how many women, how many children that were written down in, in notebooks. 
that were found after the war. Um, so attempts to cover up the crimes never quite succeeded because at the same time that the Nazis wanted to cover things up, they were also meticulous record keepers. How many people went on a train to whatever camp they were being sent to? The numbers were very important to them. So their desire to cover things up never really succeeded altogether. Um, and they use a technique of asking Jews to cover up their own crimes, meaning the crimes of the, of the Einsatzgruppe, not the crimes of the Jews, obviously. Um, so they needed the evidence to disappear. So they took the 80 um, strongest people who happened to be 76 men and four women, and they had them build their own little kind of cabins in this area and they asked them to exhume bodies, construct a, um, a you know, a, a, an area by which they would put them on using ramps and they would burn them. And they would ask them to do this several hundred per day, this horrific task. And they knew that they would be the last people killed that this is not something that would save them, that this would, they would be the last victims. So while this was going on over several months, um, this group of people began to use any skills they had to create an underground tunnel. And they had an engineer and they had various people that used whatever their professional skills were before the war to dig a 100 foot tunnel that a, one person could fit in at a time and actually escape from the burial, the area of the burial pits in the middle of the forest to, uh, to the actual forest where the partisans were fighting. Of the 80, 11 people managed to get through that escape tunnel and get out into the forest. And those 11 people would begin to talk about it after the war. And they all told similar stories, but there was no evidence that what they said was actually accurate because how do we know that an escape tunnel existed 60, 70, 75 years after the fact? Um, when in 2004, a Lithuanian excavation would find the entrance to the tunnel, but they never got further than that. Richard Freund's group, um, as well as an archeologist named Seligman, I believe, found a evidence of a middle and an end. So they were able to confirm that that tunnel actually existed and that those people's stories were accurate. And this provided a tremendous amount of closure to the uh, second and third generations of these survivors to show that the stories that they had been telling all these years were actually based in fact. And they hadn't made, you know, they hadn't elaborated, they hadn't, um, they hadn't, they, they hadn't exaggerated is rather the better, that what they said was actually true. Um, and this, this was all over international news when it came out in 2017, um, because it was such a major discovery. Um, and I thought that the film did a very nice job of talking about the experience of the archeologists, as well as giving you a little bit of history of what took place in Vilna, and also providing a little bit of insight into the scientific basis by which they made their discoveries, which is the part that I'm not so comfortable talking about because that's not my that's not my area of you know of fluency and I would probably just confuse people more if I tried to explain what they did. Um, but are there any questions yet about what um, what I've said and then we can look at some survivor testimonies. Okay, 
Um, so what I'm going to do first, actually, my first, my first um, video is actually not a testimony. It's a five and a half minute summary of the film, not the film itself, um, but an overview that might, um, the way it's presented might complement some of what I said and the film a little bit. And then we will look at the three testimonies, which are by individuals who were actually there. Um, okay. Hold on a second. I just have to get the right screen up. Um, okay. Okay. Share sound. And there we go. Taken away, you go to Pinar to die. Nobody comes out of. Okay. The end is once you get taken away, you go to Pinar to die. Nobody comes out of Pinar alive. My father said, you can try to imagine what you can't imagine it. All we thought is that someone will survive and tell the world what's going on, what happened here. In the heart of Lithuania stands a city once filled with Jewish culture and learning. They called it Vilna, the Jerusalem of the North. Vilna was one of the most important cities in Jewish history, certainly one of the capitals of uh, European Jewish civilization. And just beyond the city is a killing field few have ever heard of. It was here in Ponar Forest that roughly 70,000 people, Jews and others, were murdered and buried by the Nazis. It began as a fuel depot built by the Soviets early in the war. Construction was halted when the Nazis invaded and the unfinished pits were soon put to much darker use. After the German invasion, the Nazis brought the first Jews to the site, where they were lined up and shot. Before Eichmann sat in, in Berlin at the Wannsee Conference and proposed extermination camps, this was the tipping point. Because at this place, they began systematically killing the Jews in pits, processing them in the same way that later the extermination camps would make famous. But it began here, where people left their clothes on the side and walked to the pits, and they began killing 500, 600, 700 people per day. This is ground zero the final solution. But the horror of this place was not yet over. By December of 1943, the Nazis knew that the Russians were on the border, ready to take back Lithuania, meaning the people had been shot and they were kept in these burial pits, but they now needed the evidence to disappear into ash. The Nazi solution was simple. Only a few thousand Jews still survived in prisons and smaller labor camps in the area. They gathered the healthiest and brought them to Ponar, not to be shot, but to work. They were known as the Burners Brigade. They did work for quite a long time. They used to burn, he said, about 200 corpses on, on each layer of, uh, of wood, of logs. And uh, they used to put like, 10 layers, so it was about 2,000 corpses plus or minus a day. He said that in one big hole they counted between 22 to 25,000 bodies. People and himself dug out people that they recognized. He recognized his family by the, the way they were dressed. He recognized his wife. I think he found his two children, I'm not sure. And in December, January, they all realized 
those 80 Jews, 76 men, four women, that when they're finished, they would be the last victims. So they hatched a plan. The prisoners began digging a tunnel in the back of their small shelter. My father said they were digging with the hands, with spoons we found on the bodies, with screwdriver. And on the last night of Passover, in April, April 15th, between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, they got out. From the bunker, across 100 feet, a small 70 centimeter by 65 centimeter, just big enough for one person to slide through each one behind the other. They knew that there was great danger, but they were going to try to get through the forest without making too much noise. But they made noise. The Nazis started shooting them. It is one of the most horrific escapes that we have in the Holocaust. But it also is, I mean, the great testament to the courage and survival. Of the 80 prisoners, only a handful survived the escape. For decades, their stories were the only proof of the tunnel's existence. Until 2016, when an international team of scientists scanned the ground at Ponar and found the long-lost escape route. At last, hard proof could be added to the oral history of these survivors. Now, even as the last witnesses pass on, the world can never forget or deny this early chapter of the Nazi genocide right here in the forests of Ponar. So, truly a remarkable, remarkable story um, in terms of what those people accomplished. And I, I, I mean, when I, I read it, I'm going to share with you, and I don't know if Becca's still, Becca's not on, okay. Um, I'm just going to take a screenshot so I know who's here and actually I can just look at the recording, but I found this article that I used a little bit um, for this evening's program um, that was in Smithsonian Magazine and it's it's got some more details. It's called, um, and I'll, I'll share the link with you, it's called A Remarkable Discovery in Lithuania Brings a Legendary Tale of Survival Back to Life. Um, and it talked about how, at least I think it was in here, how people would be able to know by the clothing of the people they were, they were exhuming when they were murdered. In other words, at first they told them to wear everything. Then they, they told them to take their clothing off. They had, there were various stages. And as they were doing this, this horrific task, they actually saw, they discovered their relatives, they discovered their friends, and they could see almost chronicle the, the tasks that had, you know, these, these crimes, they would, they would be able to see a, a chronology of what had happened and how they could even I mean, I don't even know how they managed to, to live doing this for several years. And if you know about in Auschwitz, the, the Sonderkommando, those were the individuals who were asked to um, basically sh uh, take bodies from the gas chambers and put them into the ovens. Um, those were Jews. It was a very similar phenomenon of asking Jews to do this, this, you know, these tasks that of, of, of covering up the, the work, covering up the crimes by having them do this horrible, horrible jobs. And there's plenty of testimonies of people who served in the Sonder Commando um, in putting bodies into ovens and doing the, that task. And it's similar, they referred to these people as the burning brigade. These 80 people were called the burning brigade. Um, actually, that's a, that's a 
title that's used by scholars to refer to the task they were asked to do in that particular group. They're referred to often as the burning brigade because of what they were asked to do by, by the Nazis or made to do, not asked to do. Um, anyway, um, what, I, what I wanted to do now, if people don't have any other, any other comments or questions, is to look at a couple of survivor testimonies um, from this period, which will give you a sense um, because it's really the only way we can we can do this is to listen to people who actually manage to live through it. Um, so the first one, the first two testimonies are people who actually were were among those who were supposed to have been killed and they survived because something happened that where they the, the bullet did not hit them or they were they managed to get out of that burial pit the third person is a person who was one of the 11 who got out of the tunnel through the tunnel so the first two people are going to talk a woman and a man um, Okay, so the first one is Dina Baitler. Hold on one moment. Not him. Here she is. Okay. לקראת ערב הגענו למקום שם לפנה. ואז ראינו, ראינו שם שיש כבר בורות, הבורות היו כבר מוכנות. וברור שידענו שזה, שזה לא, שאנחנו לא נשארים פה, שאנחנו לא עובדים. הם עקפו אותנו מסביב, זאת אומרת, עם הכלבים, לקחו אותנו באמצע, ומסביב עם כלבים עמדו על ידינו. אמרו לנו להתפשט ולשים את הדברים במקום אחד. כל אחד התחיל להתפשט. אני התפשטתי ולא לגמרי. אני, אמרו די, נשארתי עם שמלה, עם שמלה ונעליים. הסבתא והדודה שהייתה איתי, הם היו צריכים להתפשט לגמרי. ואז <coughs> לקחו עשרה נשים, כל עשרה נשים, צבעו ללכת לבור, למד על יד הבור, ושם היו כבר האוטומטים, זה הכלי הריגה. עם, עם זה, עם האלה שישו, שישבו שם. היינו צריכים לעמוד בעשרה אנשים, הם היו, <coughs> וזה היה, היה <coughs> ליד הבור, <coughs> ואנחנו, וירו בהם, והם נפלו. אני הייתי בנחר, כמעט ובין אחרונים, ואז <coughs> הגעתי לבור, ירו בנו ונפלתי. נפלתי, הייתי, זה היה, היו, כבר הבור היה מלא. אני נפלתי בקצה, שהיו כבר הרבה אנשים, ואני הייתי ממש למעלה, בקצה. ואז הסתכלתי וראיתי הכל מה ש... זאת אומרת, ישבתי, התיישב, זאת אומרת, איך, התהפכתי איך זה שלו, והתיישבתי על, על המתים. הרבה אנשים, הם פגעו, ויש אנשים שלא פגעו, ובגלל זה כל הזמן בבור היו בכי, וכל אחד, היו ממש, 
איום ונורא, אי אפשר, אי אפשר לסבול היה בכי, ו, וביקשו, אז, זאת אומרת שרחמים, ובאו אחר כך את הנאצים, ועוד פעם, הם שמעו את ה... ש, שיש אנשים עוד חיים, <coughs> אז הם באו וירו בהם. שבע. בת שבע הייתי. I'm going to play the second one now. אני הייתי ליד סבי. לא היה לנו, לנו כבר כוח וביקשנו כבר המוות שיבוא עלינו כמה שיותר מהר. ליטאי אחד קרא סמרטוט ונתן לנו ל... לקשור העיניים. אני קשרתי העיניים קצת יותר גבוה שאני יכול לראות מה שיש מתחתיי. ושהם לא ירגישו את זה. הליטאים שירו בנו, ירו ליטאים, לא גרמנים, והם ירו מרובים רגילים. הם עמדו מעל התעלה, ואנחנו עמדנו בתוך התעלה כבר על ההרוגים. ומאחורה נתנו פקודה לראות. בזמן שנתנו הפקודה לראות, סבי, שמואל, ליפשין, אבא של אמי, התחיל להגיד שמע ישראל. אני הספקתי. אני הספקתי רק פעם אחת. להגיד שמע ישראל, ותקף היה העירייה, נפל, נפלתי לפני העירייה, וההרוגים נפלו עליי. וככה שכבתי כל הזמן. לא בכיתי. הייתי כמובן. שכבתי. ירו וירו עוד. אחר כך, אחרי הרבה זמן, פחות ופחות התחילו לירות, והיה נהיה ש, שקט, פחות או יותר. התחלתי, חשבתי שזה כבר לילה. התחלתי לי, להסתובב בגדי לצאת. כשהתחלתי להסתובב, תפסו אותי ברגל. התברר שמעלי שכב עוד אחת. גם היה לי אז, אני הייתי בן 16. היה עוד אחת ילד, גם בגילי בערך. הוא תפס אותי ברגל. התברר שגם הוא לא נפצע, וגם הוא בסדר. אח... עזרנו אחת לשני, וכשהוא ש... יצאנו מתחת להרוגים.
we're going to watch the last one. This is one of the, the men who was listed at the end of the first video, who was one of the 11 people who made it out. אחרי חיסול גטו וילנה, הגענו לפונאר. אמרו לנו לחתוך עצים, לא ידענו בשביל מה. בא המפקד של המחנה הזה של פונאר, ואמר לנו שאנחנו ניגשים לעבודה, שמו על הרגליים שרשרות. לקחו אותנו ישר לבור. העבודה שלנו הייתה... להוציא את הקורבנות מהבורות, לשים אותם על המשריפות ולשרוף אותם. זה לא יאומן, אנשים נשברו, התחילו לבכות, התחילו לתת לנו מכות נוראים. באחד הבורות אנחנו ספרנו את הקורבנות, היו שם 25,000 קורבנות. היו כמה חברים שזיהו את... הקרובים שלהם, את הנשים שלהם, לפי הבגדים, אפילו מצאו תמונות, היו מכשירים עם שפיץ עם וווים, ואתה צריך לקחת את השפיץ ולתת בתוך הגוף, להוציא אותו. אנחנו שמנו אותם על הקרשים, ראש לראש, רגל לרגל, הייתה המשרפה נבנית בערך שלושת אלפים קורבנות, ואז היו מדליקים, וזה נורא. אני רואה את האש, אני רואה את כל זה. איך שהעם שלי נשרף. רק אלוהים יודע באיזה מצב אנחנו היינו. אחרי חודש החלטנו לברוח. חפרנו מנהרה של שלושים מטר בעומק בתוך האדמה. הגענו ליער אודיסקה, ושם אנחנו התחברנו ליחידות פרטיזנים, והם דווקא היו יהודים. נלחמנו והשתתפנו בשחרור וילנה. כבר לא הייתה לי משפחה. ידעתי שאני שרפתי אותה מפונה. אני עד היום לא השתחררתי מפונה. אני רואה את זה יום-יום. לילה, לילה, בא אליי פניו. I don't really know what to say after that, um, but I think it's as painful as these are to, to listen to, we really, we owe it to our ancestors to listen to these because there's no other way that we can really come close to understanding um, what they experienced. Um, and it's just remarkable to me that people could even move on after that. Um, it, it sounds like the, the lecture that, that David and Helen listened to today, um, are David and Helen still, still here? Let me see if they, oh yes, you are. Well, you're- We're here, fiction, we're so. here. Okay. Yes, we are. Did this did that speak to some of these questions about how do you continue to believe in God after the Holocaust? How do you go yeah. on? That that was the last thing that uh, Rabbi Yitz spoke of um, of uh, you know how could God let this happen? And and it reminded me if you read the book why bad things happen to good people, it seemed like what he was saying was very similar to what. Uh, Harold Kushner said in his book that, uh, and he also talked about Kabbalah and Simpson where God pulls away. Uh, he pulls away to allow us to be in charge of, of uh, 
of the earth and uh, about our futures. Um, not that he's left us, but that he's he's um, pulled away. I, I don't want to try and explain it any better than that. I would do justice to him, but uh, that was sort of the gist of what, what he said. He also, he also talked about another very interesting thing. You talked about the records that the Germans kept. One of the reasons they kept records is they were calculating the cost of killing a Jew, which was absolutely incredible. That's why they stopped doing it in Polnar with bullets. It was too expensive. It wasn't that they were felt badly about it. It was too expensive to waste a bullet on everyone. And at one point toward the end of the war in Auschwitz, I had never heard this before, they actually have the amount of gas that they used, so it would be less expensive. Of course, the Jews suffered more and took longer to die, but it was cheaper. And he said they calculated it down. This was incredible. It took a half a penny a Jew to kill them. Yeah, mind boggling. Valerie? Um, I was always taught that help yourself and God will help you too. So you have to do things, you have to think about it, you have to do what you can, the best you can, and God will help you too. Um, the other thing I want to mention here, that uh, if you read Leo Bretholz's book, then what did they do to that he was able to escape from the train and how they worked on it and that's how he escaped and the books that uh, put in they have a tally book that they write on which person went to where, where which camp and where from everything he was listed as dead. He was listed as, or, or on the way to, uh, uh, to a death camp and uh, to his death. But he was able to escape and they didn't notice it. So he was in the books. So he was able to kind of, kind of confuse them in a way. Right. Because by their, they, they got their records wrong, so to speak. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the reason that I, that I, I, I decided this program really can't be more than an hour because watching these videos is so difficult. Um, there's really not, there's, there's nothing that I can add to that. It's a very personal experience. You could see how difficult it was for these, these individuals even to recount and relive this um, during this testimony. Um, I don't, you know, it must be with them every night of their lives after, um, but that's why Richard Freund's work is so important because chapters like this of our, of our history can't be, we just have an obligation to study them and keep teaching them. Um, and so I'm, I am finished because I, I can't add any more to what they, what they said. Um, but I hope that this gave you um, a little bit of insight into a story that maybe you hadn't known before. Um, and I'm going to, I'm trying to write down everybody who's here so I can share with you the resources that have been mentioned in the course of this uh, talk. Rachel, what were you going to say? Yes, um, thank you, Valerie. Um, I wanted to say um, two things. First of all, I was um, over Zoom with a, uh, Schechter class today, um, doing a little bit of um, teaching about the Holocaust. And uh, I just wanna say that uh, for a middle school group of children, it was very um, heartwarming to see how um, serious they took it and how 
interested they were and how passionate they were to learn. So that gives us hope for the generations to come. The other thing is that the community um, commemoration for Yom HaShoah is happening, is premiering, so to speak, this Sunday at 12 o'clock. It's on the uh, BJC uh, website. Um, it is YouTube, so it will be on eventually. Once, once it's done, it'll stay on. Uh, but if you want to be, you know, right at the moment that it's going to be first playing, it's at 12 o'clock. Um, and uh, there'll be uh, the theme this year is dreaming of a homeland. Uh, and it's about uh, the uh, uh, dreaming of Eretz Israel during the Holocaust um, while in concentration camps and, and, and other horrendous places keeping that hope alive. And there'll be, there's also a special tribute to the two, two speakers that were very active in our community who passed away this year, uh, Morris Rosen and Bluma Shapiro, who were uh, speakers uh, for many, many years. So. It is also um, listed first in the Divre after um, Shabbat services. We, we put that as the next item. So it will be easy to, easy to find. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't really know what else to say after these kinds of things. I think they just have to sink in and we just have to, we just have to live with it as painful as it is um, on this particular day of Yom HaShoah um, in order to, to, to do what we have to do as, as people lucky enough to live in today's world instead. Um, are there any remaining questions or comments or? Valerie, I just wanted to thank you for putting this program together. It was very meaningful, very moving, and of course, very disturbing, but thank you very much. All right, everyone, I wish you a, a peaceful and interesting- Valerie, it's Miriam Stern. Oh, hi, Miriam. Hi. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't get on my computer with you, but I'm on my phone. But at any rate, this was an absolutely moving thing. And I often wonder, would I be brave enough to survive when you hear the stories and read about it in books? That's all I have to say. I certainly, I, I, I know that I think a lot of us have, ans have asked that question of ourselves. And a lot of my students, when I taught college, used to say, well, when I, if I were me, I would have done. And what we always had to convince them of is that, you know, they really don't know because right. this was an alternate, this was a universe unlike anything that any of us have experienced, um, perhaps with the exception of, of Vera and other survivors. Um, but this is something that we, we hope never happens yes. again. And I don't think any of us can really know, listening to what those people went mm -hmm. through, how we would have responded in that moment. I, I, um, What's with But anyway, Linda. Valerie, um, around 1947 or 48, maybe, um, my father found a surviving brother who was a resistor and made it through the Holocaust and uh, brought him to America. And um, he could say one word in English. Are you ready? Chesterfield, that was his cigarette. And he lived with us. And he had nightmares. He, he screamed all night. It, it was so sad, but eventually he got married and he had a life for himself, uh, you know, learned to like football and, and became American. But uh, he was rescued through Hyas. And uh, my father did bring him over. So 
I know some of his stories. He lived in the forest and ate grass and raw potatoes and wound up with ulcers and whatever. It was a very sad story, but he lived to be probably 75. So I, I do remember some of the Holocaust stuff from him. I, I remember when my children were younger, they're in their 40s. Um, I don't, must have been at Beth Israel, I don't know, but I remember one case, we want our children to know about this history in Jewish life, but you don't wanna scare them either when they're very young. And I remember, I guess it was a teacher who said, it came up or something and, and she said he was a bad man like Haman. So they understood that Haman was not a nice person. He wanted to kill the Jews, but not to scare them when they're very young, to give them some idea this is a, they were talking about Hitler and to say how he was a bad guy like Haman. And the other thing I wanted to say between when my children were in elementary school and middle school, I did cultural arts for the PTA. And when they were the first year in middle school, which we ended up going to Deer Park Middle, even though we were supposed to go to Franklin, but that's another story. But I decided I would bring um, a program in and I had a survivor talk. I'm not sure, I think I might've had a uniform that I had borrowed from one of the, when the, I don't remember now what it's called, but it was a Baltimore uh, Jewish organization. And the woman talked and, and she said it. And I watched because there weren't that many Jewish kids there then. And the other children, you know, every group has had issues and people trying to kill them. And, you know, every religious or ethnic group, it's not something that's just new to Jews or anybody else. And I just wanted to enlighten them that about this Jewish thing. And um, I think it put a little seed in their mind or something to understand about other people. And some people die and some people survive. But it's, you know, I, what I worry about with the um, Holocaust, and my, both my parents, they met in New York, but both of them were German Jews, but they, they got out. My mother got out because an uncle brought 15 people over to America. She was 16 when she came to America. And my father uh, didn't have any place to go. So he went to Shanghai for 10 years. But anyway, um, I, I, I just think that um, we sh you shouldn't forget, but oh, I know. But I have always thought about like um, the Inquisition was not good for our people either. But we, I don't think, you know, um, maybe generations ago they talked about it, but we don't talk about it that much. And people were killed and murdered and had to get out. So I hope this doesn't, I hope it doesn't happen again, but I hope people remember it and not like we don't really ever think about the Inquisition in Spain and how, you know, it was a terrible time for Jews then too. So that's all I want to say. <laughs> so. Valerie, when uh, you mentioned about your students, what they say they were going to do, I remember sitting and talking to my father about the Holocaust and I probably couldn't have been more than seven or eight years old. And it was hard to get them to talk about it. But when he started talking about it, and I said, I can't understand this. They're gonna kill you anyway. Why didn't you fight back? There was hundreds of you, they have guns, but they're gonna shoot you anyway. And he never really gave me an answer. He just said, you don't understand the way it was. And it was really hard for me to accept that. And uh, I forgot about it until you mentioned that about uh, your students. It's the first thing that comes to your mind saying you're going to die anyway. 
So why not do something? They're going to shoot you. How can you just be there like sheep? And it's a hard thing to grasp what they went through and how they suffered and what their mindset was and knowing you're going to be killed and do absolutely nothing and just kneel and take a bullet to the head. It's a difficult thing to grasp and understand. Uh, resistance is that simply maintaining your dignity in any possible way was a form of resistance. Making it through one hour of this um, was a form of resistance because when someone's goal is to strip you of your humanity in every possible way, anything you can do that maintains your dignity and your sense of self and your sense of self-worth is a form of resistance. Um, yeah. And, you know, notions of resistance have really evolved quite considerably from what they were when scholarship or originated on this subject, which was basically if you didn't, if you didn't fight in the Warsaw ghetto uprising, you weren't resisting. Well, that's, that's not how people today understand what it meant to resist given those circumstances. The resistance was that they dig dug the tunnel. Right, right. In this, in this story, yes. But you could also just argue that just living one more day um, was a form of resistance. I, uh, <clears throat> my grandfather uh, was, uh, survived uh, a lot. And there was a, he lived in, in uh, Warsaw in a street called Mila. And there was a book called Mila 18. Mm -hmm. Mila 18 was a place where there was another tunnel. And I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that tunnel he told me about, which was an underground. And it was the source ultimately of some of the uh, resistance fighting in Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, he didn't uh, trust that, that he had his own tunnel system that he built in his house and resisted as long as he could. Uh, but uh, maybe you could mention something about the tunnels in the uh, Warsaw Ghetto and uh, how they were used for resistance. Um, for that question, I would probably want to do a little bit more research before sharing that. It's been a while since I studied the Warsaw Ghetto, and I would need to look it up but I would be happy to share more when I look it up. Um, I think I have written down everybody's email addresses. Um, so I'm going to share with you a few resources in an email to follow up on this program. I'll, save, I'll give you links to a few things that I shared with you tonight um, and to this really good Smithsonian article, and I'll try to answer Ray's question. Um, and I think that that is where I will end. Um, so thank you for sharing your responses. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that everyone got something out of this and if hopefully has more questions on what to study next. And um, I guess that will be our, the end of our program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valerie. Thank that you, was an Valerie. excellent addition. Thank to you, Valerie. Movie. Really thank, was. You. Wonderful thank, thank you. Thank you. Has to be retold year after year. Thank you. It's a hard thing to talk about. Thank you.